Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining this morning's uh, final presentation of the MHCID Capstone Project with Team Smokey and the Electric Electronic Incident Action Plan. Um, this is uh, the outcome of a two quarter long um, research design studio sequence uh, that was already officially kicked off in winter quarter with you know, team formation and project scoping. Um, the MHCID program is a one year interdisciplinary master's program at the University of Washington jointly run by the uh, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, the Division of Design and the School of Art, Art History and Design, the Department for Human Centered Design and Engineering and the UW I School. It's a one year program where students go through a sequence of courses, always paired in studio and theory courses, where the studio courses are co taught by faculty from different departments. And our focus is on bringing up leaders uh, in the arena of interdisciplinary human computer interaction and design, uh, research and development. And uh, um, this is our eighth cohort um, that's graduating this year. So with that, I want to quickly start with introductions of uh, project partners and instructional team. My name is Axel Rosler. I'm a professor for interaction design and chair of the interaction design program in the Division of Design School of Art, Art History and Design. And I've been co-teaching uh, the Capstone Studio as well as another class this year. Um, been co-teaching the Capstone Studio with uh, Scott Ishikawa. Scott, you want to say a few words? Sure, I'd be happy to say a few words. So hi, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Scott Ichikawa. Um, I'm a lecturer with the MH Southwest D program at, Uni at the University of Washington. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with these students pretty much for this past year, pretty much from their first kickoff of the program, um, all the way through the capstone research class and the design class with Axel this past quarter. Um, and so I've just had the unique privilege of seeing all these people grow. And I'm so excited just to see them present all their hard work. And I know they've put a lot of hard work into this project. So I'm just excited to be here. Great. Uh, Nori, why don't you say a few words? Yeah, so um, Launch was really excited to co-sponsor this um, project this year. And um, we, we really gave them a lofty uh, <laughs> project brief. Um, and it was such a pleasure to mentor all four of these, um, these students and just see how they uh, took our challenges head on, um, worked really hard both quarters. Um, and I'm really excited to, to see what they've got to present for y'all today. Fantastic. Uh, Lauren, is Lauren joining us or we can also maybe loop in Lauren later? That sounds good. Fantastic. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Team Smokey. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our final Capstone presentation. We are very excited to share our product EIAP, which stands for Electronic Incident Action Plan with you. Um, just a reminder, the presentation will be recorded. Um, so if you don't want to show uh, appear in the recording, just turn off your camera. And my name is Ren. With me today are my amazing teammates, Macy, Joan, and Fontaine. We are master's students from the Human Computer Interaction and Design Program at the University of Washington. And our instructors are Scott and Axel, and our project is advised by Laura and Lauren from Launch Consulting. Today, we also have our special guests from Northwest 12 Incident Management Team and all the people who have helped us in this process. So thank you so much and also welcome. Today, we will have a 20 minutes presentation followed by a 25 minutes Q&A section. This is a photo that was taken in September 2020 at 11 a.m. in downtown San Francisco. Yes, you're right. This is 11 a.m. in the morning. I was after sunrise on that day. Like many people in the city, I was waiting for the daylight. Instead, I got only the faintest suggestion that somewhere above the smoky skies, the sun has indeed risen. In that month, we were all wearing masks, not because of COVID, but wildland fires. 
Wildland fires are becoming more intense and frequent at an unprecedented speed and scale across the globe due to climate change, increased development in wildland urban interface, and accumulation of fuel loads from prior fire suppression efforts. However, responders still rely on a traditional process in fighting wildland fires. All the critical information for each operational day is communicated through this paper document called the Incident Action Plan. It is used to communicate critical information to everyone on the fire. This includes fire location, incident objective, resources, work assignment, fire and weather forecasts, important safety messages, etc. However, it is created the day before and doesn't get updated throughout the day. This leads to decision-making with limited information, putting personnel safety and operation at risk. To solve this problem, we designed a platform called EIAP. And now um, I would like to show you our concept video to give you a better idea of how this product works. Managing wildland fires is a complex process that involves coordination between many different groups in rapidly changing situations. Incident management teams rely on a paper document called the Incident Action Plan, or IAP, to communicate key objectives, critical information, and logistics, everything needed to fight a wildfire. Producing the IEP is time intensive, with specialists working 16-hour days to input all the latest information manually, printing out hundreds of copies every night so firefighters on the field can have the situational awareness they need each morning. But often, situations change during the day, and firefighters only have radios and face-to-face -face interactions to communicate. This leads to decision-making with limited information putting personnel safety and operations at risk and makes it difficult to use resources effectively and compromises accountability on the fire line. But it doesn't have to be this way. The EIAP, or the Electronic Incident Action Plan, provides incident management teams with real-time data to ensure the safety of operations and personnel. During the daily morning briefing, everyone on the fire can use the EIAP to review the latest fire information and the roles and objectives of each division. Division supervisors use the roll call feature to account for everyone they are responsible for. As divisions head out to their assigned areas, their location and status are tracked in real time. This division supervisor notices a change in the weather and takes a geotagged photo of the situation and sends it back to the incident management team. The fire behavior specialist and incident meteorologist get the photo which confirms the high winds and update the EIAP in real time, alerting all supervisors that have personnel in the affected areas. Based on the alert, the operations team on the field re-evaluates the situation and the division supervisor requests immediate air support before things get out of hand. The request is sent to the operations section chief, responsible for all tactical strategies for sign-off. As soon as it's approved, the EIAP notifies the division supervisor. Within an hour, air support arrives and suppresses the fire enough for the ground crew to finish their work to keep the fire from advancing. In situations like these, the EIAP can drastically improve wildland fire management, putting the safety of responders at the forefront. All right, so that is the EIAP. And now that you've seen a little bit about how it can be used, I'll go into more detail about how we designed it. And first off, research um, to understand the complex world of wildland fire management spanned 
pretty much the entire project for us. We began with secondary research, such as literature and policy reviews, and did competitive analysis of existing products in wildland fire management. And then for primary research, we conducted over 24 interviews with subject matter experts, a few of which are here today, thank you, um, and performed ethnographic and observational research on two field trips to wildland fire incidents. And first and foremost, we learned that safety is the number one priority in wildland fire management. And we realized that whatever we designed, we also needed to prioritize safety and accountability in our design. And we also realized just how quickly wildfire situations can change and that communication of information doesn't always keep up. And as one of our interviewees said, it's a very dynamic environment. The maps that you get in the morning are totally different in two hours anyways. You have to use your own situational awareness and your experience to determine what's actually going on on the ground. And real-time IAP information would enable better communication and situational awareness in these dynamic environments. This supports improved decision-making, decreases risk, and increases accountability and safety. And finally, technology is a key enabler in delivering real-time information. Although there are challenges such as connectivity in remote areas, and there's a lot of resistance to change in terms of the ways of doing things, more and more technology is already being used out there. And for example, there are a lot of third-party apps like you see right here, and more mobile phone and satellite usage than ever, augmenting radio communication, which can only be used to say so much and in one particular format. And internet usage is already becoming way more commonplace, and it's a mandatory requirement now to have in the incident command post. And with the EIAP, we're leveraging existing technology that's already available today to be able to standardize and update how people access critical information for safety and operations. And so based on this assumption that there will be some sort of infrastructure infrastructure support for technology in wildland fire in the future, um, we brainstormed over 90 ideas to address how we could actually use technology to improve the safety of wildland fire management. And these ideas ranged anywhere from map-based software to accessory items for radios and cameras to smart clothing items, tracking devices, and warning systems. And so we, after the, this ideation process, we also conducted a design workshop with three of, our, three of our participants where we asked them to vote on our ideas and then select one of them and then write a story about how that idea could be used in the field. And from this process, two ideas um, surfaced. The first one being a map-based system that suggested optimal escape routes in an emergency fire situation. However, two out of the three participants were really captivated by the idea of a digital IAP and came up with multiple features that they wanted to include. Um, and these consisted of the ability to see, uh, see graphical representations of resources on the map, um, a system that provided real-time information and weather information. And they saw the potential for this digital IAP to be adaptable and flexible, uh, which really contrasted with the current process. And so for us to gain a firsthand experience and how, how the IAP was created, um, how it's distributed and used, our team conducted two field studies with the Northwest 12 Incident Managed Team and the Dispatch Center in Menachee. And there we actually got to observe and shadow teams to really look at how the IAP, um, the entire IAP process and how resources were actually requested, how they were approved, and how they influence their daily operations, um, as well as what type of technologies they currently use and the processes that they wish were uh, better improved. And so based on our research and our experience in the field, we decided to sketch out a storyboard and reimagined how the EIAP would function at a wildland fire incident. And this is also where we decided that our product would be tablet and mobile based because these were two of the technologies that we saw um, were used out on the field. And so during this storyboarding process, we also identified critical components of the IAP that were important for safety and accountability. These included uh, the ability to uh, visually see assignments, weather and fire behavior on the map, um, the ability to request, approve, and track resources that included both equipment and people, as well as a roll call feature to account for people assigned to that day's operations. 
And so once we identified these key flows, we knew that we needed to design a usable and simple navigation to allow e users to easily access and identify these important features of the EIAP. Um, so as a result, we made several iterations of the main menu. And as you can see on the screen here, there is both a top and left navigation menu, a top only navigation, a left navigation, and a floating horizontal navigation. Uh, but we finally settled on a floating vertical navigation on the left um, for several reasons. One that we found uh, horizontal navigations were harder to reach on a tablet and were better suited for a desktop. We also wanted to maximize the amount of uh, map real estate on the screen since this was the primary way for users to actually visualize and receive information. And then lastly, because of the specific needs of wildland fire management, menus uh, that only showed icons did not really provide enough affordances for what they were. So we needed a menu that, were, that was clearly labeled. And so once we established a navigation frame and the key flows, we tested it out with two of our participants which led us to refine which features uh, needed to be always present in the menu versus the ones that should be shown on a map after a particular action was taken. Uh, we also started to associate and connect the text items with the map to provide visual cues and visual information. And we added additional map functions that allowed users to edit and interact with the map itself. And so every part of this process helped us refine the IAP, EIAP design and so let's take a look at some of the final key flows. Um, the first flow we designed was the general map navigation since that provides the foundation for all the other key flows. So uh, you can see here the left nav is a primary menu and when users click on the menu icon, it takes them to the submenu that includes all the formal ICS forms and documents that are required by the government for record keeping. And these are also the forms that are included in the IAP. Um, and we also wanted users to be able to view and filter specific information on the map because current maps are filled with so much information at once that it becomes difficult to decipher what is what. And so to do this, we have a map menu function to allow users to toggle things on and off like weather specific items and even manual entry items. And so now that you have a basic understanding of how a typical user would navigate this interface, let's um, take a look at how the EIP would operate during the day at a fire incident. Sure, so 1650 AM in the morning, right after the daily briefing, division supervisors check in personnel and equipment that they are responsible for by teams in the app. This information is updated to the whole incident management team right away. Throughout the day, if anything changes, division supervisors can always come back and update it. As you can see in the background image, currently um, division supervisors are doing roll calls on their notebooks or directly on the paper IAP. Any changes on personnel and equipment are unable to get updated promptly to other functional teams who need this information. This information get may result in unnecessary delay on decision-making or even compromise decisions since they are based on inaccurate data. After the roll call, division supervisors can tap on the direction button on the top bar to navigate to their assignment. On the field, division supervisors can track personnel and equipment on the map. This map is fluid aiming to provide different information tailored to different needs. Um, here, I wanna highlight three map levels that we define. The first is the high level view of the incident. As you can see in the screen, there are four blue numbers on the map. Each number is the sum of the personnel and equipment associated with that division. This provides division supervisor a big picture of the distribution of resources in a, in a whole incident. If division supervisors zoom into the map, they can go to the division level of the map, which is probably the most critical and frequent view for them. Here, um, they can track the resources from team's perspective. Different teams within a division are indicated by different colors. And on top of each color number, there is a chip with an unique identifying resource designator. 
which can help division supervisors to further distinguish teams with the same functionality. Division supervisors can further zoom in if they want to learn about the details of a specific team. This will bring them to the team level of the map, which is also the lowest level. As they zoom into the map, the numbers disappear and are replaced by individual responders indicated by their initials. If the team is assigned an equipment, an icon of the equipment is also shown on the map. This level of information can promote accountability and safety of individual firefighters. So this is the image capture feature. Personnel on the field often need to share information with each other to update the group on situational awareness. A commented photo update shared with others is one way to disseminate that information. Different types of data would be sent to different people to approve before distributing it to the whole group. And then for alerts, getting and receiving alerts between the incident management team and the personnel on the field is very important for situational awareness as well, because many things like wind, more aggressive fire danger, and uh, lightning may pose immediate <clears throat> issues to the responders on the field. Currently, updates and alerts are communicated through radio, but you might not be able to know whether that message was received, especially if it's a message to many people. The EIEP prompts the user to confirm that they have received the alert, giving feedback to those that have um, sent the message. And division supervisors out in the field can send requests for resources directly through the IEP using the integrated ICS 213 resource request form. In this case, they're requesting an air tanker to drop fire retardant. And they can indicate where the retardant drop points are by tapping directly on the map, and the coordinates are automatically populated. They can then review details of their request and submit it for approval. And depending on the type of request, this form might look a little bit different. Um, so for example, you might be assigning new crews or bringing in equipment such as dozers and moving it around. The idea is that you can always allocate them directly on the map in relation to where the existing resources are, what's going on out, on out there. And when the request is submitted, the operations section chief receives a notification about it. And they're able to directly review the details of the request from their mobile device and approve it. And if necessary, the request can be then sent to dispatch for further action with an integration with their Wildcat system. And with the air tanker on its way, you can also track its progress on the map towards the drop points by clicking on it and selecting the follow or the eye icon on the interaction wheel. And on the right, you'll see information such as its destination, its estimated time of arrival, and the EIAP gives you a better sense of when your requested resources are arriving and be able to visually see their progress on the map. And status of all resources on the map can actually be viewed in the same way by clicking on them to see the interaction options for that resource. For example, you can navigate to the resource, share their location with somebody else, and uh, view more information about them on their resource status card. And this panel is modeled after the paper resource status card or T cards used in the incident command system to be able to keep track of resources. And it includes incident related information such as their task, assignment, and goals for the day, the check in time, um, and what transportation vehicle they're on. And a second tab contains basic information for the resource, including identification number, contact information. Um, and their qualifications and certifications. And this provides access to a lot of information that's not on the paper IEP. It allows you to check in on personnel more often or reallocate resources according to how long they've been on shift already uh, or what their specific skills are. Okay, so now we're going to address connectivity because there's not always cell coverage or Wi-Fi in the wilderness or wildland firefighters work. A possible solution could be to bridge the gap between the areas of no, low, cellular, and Wi-Fi connectivity. In the morning, people already download maps from QR codes at the incident command post, so they could use the same connectivity to sync to the EIAP in the morning. 
Okay, and these different features are download by division if they're poor or a low connection, um, force refresh if you know you should have a connection in that area, and closest connectivity, you can see where you last had connectivity and where there might be connectivity based on crowdsource data. So you could drive there if you wanted to. And you can also prioritize uploads if your connectivity is low or spotty. For next steps, if we were to continue this project, uh, creating mockups for the drag and drop interface for the personnel reassignment, requesting and improving multiple things at once and queuing personnel for the next day might be some things that we would do. Um, we would also look at the integration with the dispatch software Wildcad as well as iSight. And we'd like to do continued collaboration with incident management teams to get a lot of different perspectives and situations. So our key takeaways from the EIP were, Experiencing is always better than secondary research. You don't know what it's like until you're there. And we learned more being at the incident command post and in the field for one day than weeks of researching online. Also, integration is paramount. People are already using different types of software and it makes it much easier if the data is connected. And also the EIP is not just for wildland fire. This software would work for other first responder situations that use the incident command structure. The EIP can also be applied to floods, earthquakes, COVID, and other situations. And now we'd like to open up the floor for questions. Comments and critiques also welcome. Thank you, Team Smokey. This was fantastic. Um, and you know, in, in particular, since we have the opportunity to have some folks from Northwest 12 on the call, um, maybe some reactions from Northwest 12, if anybody uh, wants to chime in with some thoughts, you know, how was it to work with, you know, uh, our team from the University of Washington, you know, how, what happened during failed visits? Like, how was the whole uh, experience from your end working, um, you know, on this design project? Uh, or, you know, general comments about the product, uh, potential um, users of this in the future, you know, how realistic is it, you know, what are some of your thoughts? Uh, good morning, my name is Bob Schindler, I'm the incident commander for Northwest Incident Management Team 12, and uh, we're uh, joined with uh, other members of the incident management team, including our planning section, uh, operations, uh, finance, and uh, a number of others, uh, safety. And so uh, what I would just say is that uh, we are very excited about the EIAP. And when we were introduced to this uh, great team, uh, we had lots of questions and it, we learned just as much as probably they learned about the possibilities um, and how a product like this could be incorporated in the complex planning process that we have for incident management teams. You know, I, I look at the uh, current national activity of uh, wildland fires that are occurring across the United States right now. We're in national preparedness level five. We've been there for uh, well over a month now. There's over 22,000 firefighters committed to the firefighting efforts. And there are many other incident management teams doing the exact same work that we're doing right here today on the Whitmore fire. And, uh, uh, and, it, and this product and the idea and the concepts that are going along with it are uh, amazing to all of us and uh, the possibilities are, are it's, it's actually uh, uh, something that is needed and uh, would definitely be used by teams uh, you know i think the, the energy that uh, joan and ran and fontaine and macy brought to this project was incredible uh, they put in some very long days with us and uh, they were very well engaged we had them shadow every section of the incident management team. We did field tours. Uh, they worked with us from the early morning hours at five in the morning till uh, 2100, 2200 at night, uh, working through our whole planning process. So they definitely were exposed to the work and effort that goes into developing an incident action plan and also how it is utilized by the firefighters in the field. And uh, uh, we can see the safety benefits uh, that this product could bring to uh, wildland fire management, as well as streamlining our planning process, creating efficiencies, and reducing costs for uh, for wildland fire because uh, of the, the planning process just being real time. 
and being able to make critical decisions as an incident commander with real-time information is so important, and this product will play uh, uh, an important role in that. I'll just turn over the team up, but do you have any other comments? I just want to say that uh, the team was delightful. We enjoyed every second we had with them. They came in energetic, ready to learn. They came in an open book, and everything they learned, they started to incorporate it. They started to grow the process. They were they were unafraid to just uh, dive in and figure out from the very instant of how we did it. They just asked question after question. It was just a great process, and we really enjoyed it. Uh, what I would add is I'm very impressed with uh, how many of the items that uh, we brought up uh, as ideas or challenges and, you know, challenge them with how would they handle this and how they handle this. And uh, I mean, things that I only mentioned once and they incorporated nearly all of the things. And uh, I mean, I had a number of questions lined up. They answered them already with, with the, uh, the presentation they did. Uh, so it really took away uh, the, the number of my questions. But uh, Great group, uh, very engaged, and uh, I think they, uh, they uh, have the ability to turn out a great product with it. Very impressive. So the last comment that I would make is that uh, I would hope that somebody in the industry would take this uh, project and this idea and run with it. Um, there is a great need for it, and uh, uh, it would bring us uh, into modern times here in so many ways because we're really using planning processes that were developed in the early 1980s. And many of the steps that we go through are still very much manual oriented and, uh, uh, and it's very labor intensive. It requires a lot of work and a lot of effort from a number of people to uh, make the incident action plan a reality every day. And uh, uh, so anyway, I, kudos to the team. Congratulations to all four of you. I wish you all the best. And uh, this whole team does. We're excited for you, and uh, uh, we wish you, uh, you know, great success in your future. So, thank you. Yay! Thank you so much, Bob. I do also want to say that uh, we will share the research with anyone that's interested. If you find anyone, if you want us to present this to anyone else, we'd be very, very happy to do that, for sure. Nice work. Hey, John, this is Richie. Hey, Richie, welcome. Thank How you are you so guys? Much. Oh, we're doing really well. This Good. is this is our last thing we have to do before graduation. So well, thank you, you so a, much for coming. You guys did an outstanding job. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richie Herod. I'm a, a former incident commander with Team 12. And uh, Joan and team reached out to me to get connected you know, in the field and, and I helped them get connected with the team and, and the work. First thing I would say is uh, this maybe is the first time that I've seen a research project done by students or somebody from outside the fire organization that actually uh, grasped all the concepts in such a way that when I listened to the presentation, I didn't go, well, that's not right or this isn't right because uh, you guys learned uh, the language of incident command and the details of what we do in the field to the point where it's pretty clear to me you understand what the issues are. So congratulations on that. That's not a small feat to learn in, in such a, a small period of time. Uh, my question is, I just have one question that I didn't know if you addressed in your research. And so I think this is fantastic. And I do believe it's probably the, the wave of the future. But one, one thing we talked about is the amount of time that it takes to build a paper IAP. And as I listened to this and I looked at the software, you, you've taken a lot of that workload out, but someone has to input data to this thing so that it can be used. So did you guys take any time to kind of analyze the amount of time on the paper side versus the amount of time on the electronic side for input and what are the cost, what are the time saving elements of that? Okay, should I should I take this one? Okay, so we we did look at um, how 
the uh, the data is going to go into the EIEP. We're thinking that it would start with dispatch because dispatch already has a lot of the information about each of the teams and each of the personnel. And once that gets rolling into the EIEP, like almost all of the hourly things are the same. Like people are only allowed to work, you know, a certain number of days, certain number of hours, and those would tick down in the EIEP. And then when they do the... Um, the oh what oh I forgot what it was called but the demo oh demobilization when they do the demobilization then that would also talk to dispatch again and then dispatch would know when people are released and then it would go back into the dispatch system. Okay, so you so you have an incident management team made up of sixty individuals from perhaps six different dispatch units around the Northwest. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to get uh, each of those dispatch areas to input data for a single fire in Northern Washington? We so actually, I'm getting at? Yes, but okay. So maybe we didn't see that clearly enough at the dispatch center, because when we went to the dispatch center in Wenatchee, I think it was CWCC sure. or something like that. They said for each incident management team, they had a list of people and it was in their database and they would just grab all of those people and put them into dispatch and say that they were, um, they were mobilized. Okay, so very, they, very good. So the hosting dispatch would then, of where the fire is, they're the ones that would populate the data. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and it should be in Wildcad. Am Correct. I okay? So if that's in Wildcad and there's in interoperability, it should be able to port the data into the EIP okay. if those two were connect connected. Good, very good. I think maybe it also depends on which which pieces of data or which parts of the information that we showed were, that we were talking about, um, because I think there was also a lot of. Um, we were thinking, or we had observed at least, a lot of these um, updates throughout the day have to go on radio or on phone calls to um, one particular, like the, some of the um, divisional supervisors would end up calling the operations section chief for anything. And then you'd have to get into a room towards the end of the day all to summarize all that information and try and make those decisions. So part of this concept too is the idea that if everybody had a tool um, to be able to input some of this information throughout the day, it would lessen some of that back end work to co uh, collect all the data, collate it, and then uh, coordinate it. And there's somebody also right now currently who's inputting it and creating that paper IEP, right? So we would be able to do away with that process. But the question of whether or not shifting that workload throughout the day, whether it's possible for people who, you know, maybe out there with lots of things going on around them to change that, like we would have to be able to test that to see in reality whether or not it was maybe more feasible and easier because you're distributing the workload a little differently. Good. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you kind of understood that uh, how that system works, because that mm -hmm. may be one area that you haven't looked at in detail and need to test that Dispatch offices often get inundated in a busy fire season with multiple tasks, and they may be managing more than just one wildland fire. They may be managing up to mm -hmm. 200 or 300 wildland fires, small and big, all alike. And so one of the things you're going to have to think about a little bit, and I don't think it's anything that can't be overcome, but just this workload is the upfront part. Once you get on a fire and you're using the tool on the fire, then the folks that are in the planning section that are already entering data would just be learning how to enter data in a different way in an electronic environment rather than uh, through paper copy. So uh, I would just say that's one area is kind of the upfront load and how that interfaces with dispatch and the importance of not adding more to an already, you know, overwhelmed organizations. Just one thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's a really important point. Um, I would also like to add that I think um, in the design workshop that we conducted with uh, Yosh, who's here, 
and a couple other people, uh, we were talking about the idea of like, what if what, whatever you interact with on the map could somehow populate into like this formal ICS form. And so there isn't this need to like manually enter items and perhaps you could like save time by if you're able to drag and drop a resource at this place, then it just automatically updates the resources assigned to that particular division. Um, but we didn't have enough time to design that out, but yeah. Yeah, just one point to add to that. We are thinking after all this movement in the app, um, our platform can help generate those ICS forms and then you, know, you can just export it and send it to the government or any places that need this form. Uh, this is Bob Schindelar, uh, Incident Commander for Team 12. I do have a question for you. Uh, the Incident Action Plan is uh, a document that, uh, a legal document that, that documents the activities for the Incident Management Team and all the resources that are assigned. And one of my uh, tasks is to review that Incident Action Plan for accuracy each day when it's created in the evening uh, before it goes to be published. Uh, will Will or how how do you see the EIP uh, potentially um, helping uh, reduce the number of errors that may occur from our current process to using the, the, the EIP kind of? Okay, so the way I did notice a few ways that there could be errors when I was there the last time at the Whitmore fire. A lot of the times it's like um, spelling of names or different people were in different uh, divisions that they were not supposed to be in. And there were just there were just little errors like that. And I feel like if all the information is, is being taken from these databases that already have them, and you're moving, dragging, and dropping people around, then you don't have to re-input those people over and over and over again, because it's like, it's like a game of telephone. Every time you input it, you may not, every time you have to input it, it might be wrong that time. So the taking out of the manual inputs would help alleviate the errors that way. Richie, did you have something to add? Well, I have a uh, kind of a follow-up to, to Bob's question, and that is, because it is a legal document, this data gets stored and often is called upon by the agencies in the aftermath of fires, even years down the road. And historically, that's all by paper copy, and then it goes to eventually it goes to the um, to a storage base nationally, and you know it's stored. The hard copies are stored. Um, I didn't hear you say how the data gets stored on a daily basis or how it could be accessed. Yes, we were thinking that it, every single day at the end of the day, like just like it does now, because I did see that um, um, when I was there, Jill was taking updates for the incident action plan from division supervisors and what they had done during the day. And hand updating it each of the pages to be able to to do that so there would probably be a cutoff for each day and that day would probably be sent off to to an the incident the incident commander to uh to look over to make sure everything's correct or uh whoever needs to approve it for the day and those would be saved and then it would go on to the next day and the next day after that. And the EIEP would actually do one better because every time someone would come in from the incident, you would be able to play back where they had been throughout the day because these devices are tracking their location. So I don't know if you've noticed the little play bar at the bottom, you can play back what happened that whole day and what each person did and where each person was. So if there was some kind of like legal dispute, they could go back and see exactly where those people were on that specific day. And that would probably help talk about the situation in addition to the other things. Good. No more, is, oh, no more hiding on the division soups there, Team 12. You guys can't go hide at your favorite tree. 
<laughs> so, so I guess I would like to just add a comment is that uh, not only for, for legality reasons, uh, you know, very much in the wildland world uh, of all the fire personnel that are assigned, it's a learning environment. And uh, we are constantly learning from uh, a number of things, you know, uh, what, what's gone right, but also, you know, when accidents happen or tragedies that occur, you know, we, we try to learn from those events. And I, I believe that a product like this would almost also give us that opportunity to replay, to do an after action review. That's almost like live, you know, real time and uh, allow us to, uh, to a greater extent, even learn more about how we could improve the safety culture in wildlife firefighting. Oh, that's such a good point. That's such a good point, Bob. Thank you so much. We were also thinking it could be helpful for wayfinding because when we were trying to uh, go around the the um, in the field, it was hard for people to find locations. And I even got a text message from one of the division supervisors saying that a drop point was in the wrong location. So if we had this this uh, tracking from the previous days, you could definitely see like where everyone has been before, and you would know where the roads were, where the drop points were by that previous data. So yes, the, the AI and predictive uh, learning would be good. And from where people have been before, you would know like which drop points would, needed, would need to be updated and um, where people were working and that sort of thing. Well, <clears throat> imagine also an injury and you have a REM, a rapid extraction module with a paramedic and the individual's location could be easily marked on the map and where the REM is or where the other uh, medics might be to access. I think that is a huge improvement, especially as we look at some past injuries in the past and what happened with those. And we all know about what we call the golden hour, getting that help there to critical injuries with under an hour to definitive care. So this could be a re this could be a big step forward on, on that part. All right, thank you. It's a fantastic project. Thank you, Team Smokey. And thank you for the folks from Northwest 12 uh, for chiming in here. And you know, just illustrating to us how complex this problem space is, right? And how many opportunities we have to design, make positive impact where, you know, traditionally so much effort goes into consumer applications and experiences. And here we have a really meaningful high stakes case where technology can make a difference in critical situation and help first responders do the right thing and allocate their resources right. Um, I, I, you know, we have scheduled this for an hour time frame, but you know, what we can also do is we can keep this conversation up a, a little bit longer past 11. I just wanted to give quickly our industry partners, um, the advisors uh, from Launch Consulting, Nora and Lauren, maybe an opportunity to chime in to maybe, uh, and contribute a few reflections from their front on how it was to work with Team Smokey on this. Sure. Uh, thank you, Axel. So I'm Lauren and uh, Nora and I were able to be the industry advisors and, and we really kind of put together the project brief here because what we what we noticed in um, some of our consulting work is that there was a there, there's a very strong need for public sector design thinking to be done. Um, we were approached with an RFP from California State um, Office of Emergency. And what was really obvious about that RFP is they were asking all the wrong questions. They weren't going to be like, they're, they're trying to buy something off the shelf that doesn't exist. And so when the, the capstone team um, needed um, something to like really sink their teeth into, um, we saw this as a huge opportunity to marry um, folks who can essentially pro bono go do a, an, an in-depth research project around an area where there's a need to have that kind of in-depth research, but nobody's going to be able to fund that before it's done. And so there's a chicken, the egg problem of like, can we even imagine a new solution? And here we did that is the the team was able to go in there and imagine a new solution and as we heard from from the the folks in the field that like now that they see it they're like please somebody build this um, and that's the missing link for a lot of these public sector works is is getting to the point where we can cross that barrier to imagination to see like what would a, a solution even be like how do we even describe it to ask for the funding to go build it um, and so these are the kinds of projects that I think that the academic space is 
you know, supremely suited to do. Um, and, and beyond that, I've been really impressed with the, with the team's ability to, um, really like tackle some of the, the challenging, uh, like rocks in the stream that go everywhere from, you know, the technical connectivity issues to the, you know, interaction affordances to, um, you know, going and, and interviewing folks in the field and realizing that there are real humans on the other end of this interaction um, and, and making sure that those real humans and their needs are represented in the functionality of the software. It's not just something that, you know, we looked at a big Excel spreadsheet and satisfied all the requirements. Um, so like, this is, this is, I think, the, a really great example of, um, you know, this is the way and they've done it. Nora? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, all four of you have been such a pleasure to work with and it's been um, so inspiring and encouraging to see you all sink your teeth into such a difficult problem. Um, so I actually have a, a question for the team that I'm, I'm really interested to hear. So like moving from a, you know, established paper um, IAP to a digital IAP, like you suddenly have all these really interesting new ways of displaying information and conceptualizing, um, you know, all the complexity in there. Um, and so I've seen a lot of that through the map, um, but I'm really curious, you know, you've got a lot of like labels and icons and color designations. Um, talk to me about what ways of displaying information you're adopting from the way people have been using it and um, what new opportunities you're introducing through your design work. Um, I guess some of the similar ways that we're leveraging current um, display of information is like all the icons that are on current paper maps are the same on the digital map. Um, so same shape, same color, same everything. And um, even like the, originally when we designed the menu, we just uh, categorized it into like, you know, safety or operations. But one person was like, no, you got to put the ICS numbers in so that they know exactly what it is. And even the panels that were designed, they were modeled after the paper documents. And so there's some familiarity with uh, some of these designs. And I would say the, the new type of information that we're providing is just like that um, automatic like visual information that is working in conjunction with the text uh, information. I don't know if somebody else wants to add anything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add that we did spend quite a bit of time looking at information architecture and what would be the best way of dividing all of these different informations, like all of the different information and structuring it um, in the actual, when we talked about, you know, the navigation bar and the menus, how should we structure that? And as Maisie was saying, that was all too. We realized that because in our research, we talk so much with people about challenges in terms of adoption of technology, one of the ways to massage that, make it a little bit easier, right? Is needing that sense of familiarity um, and safety and having it translate directly to um, what they were already currently using. So even in terms of having the data, being able to, for now, export directly into the different ICS forms that are currently being used so that that's, that's something that they could submit off wherever they need, they need to go. Because right now it all still does go on paper, though ideally Blue Sky wouldn't, um, in my opinion, at least. I might be wrong. I'm sure there are good reasons for that. Um, so trying to stick to those existing uh, protocols that are really, um, the core foundation of how incident management teams run. And of course, it could evolve as time goes on. This could just be the bridge to better and more technology in the future. And, you know, I think the big opportunity here, too, is that, you know, this is now this exists now as a design proposal and a video prototype and a very detailed documentation right, and a very detailed presentation. And we're at the University of Washington here, right? An institution that is interested in contributing in, you know, the challenges that face us, you know, with the with the emerging wildfires and the situation is getting really, really, really difficult. And uh, also our program is tied in with all these tech industry partners, right? That 
browse our website and try to find our students, right? So I think what you really achieved here is that you have gone into the field, that you have looked very carefully, very deep, that you have learned the language, understand the stakes, learn to communicate this, right? And now that we have this piece here that we can share and that we can connect this potential revenue, uh, not revenue, but research funding avenues, right? Of, you know, either from industry or from government organizations. And, you know, you have created this piece, this starting point. And it's a, it's a very impressive work. Uh, what you've done here in 20 weeks, right? Uh, is usually uh, outcomes we see in two year processes of doing things uh, in slow university or research cultures in general, let alone government uh, development cycles, right? So this is impressive, very strong work. Congratulations, you all. Scott, you, you have some thoughts for sure that you wanna add? <laughs> I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm not gonna say a whole lot. Uh, I just wanted to say, when you take on projects, especially ones that are a complex system, such as this one, where there's so many stakeholders, I remember when this team showed up one day and they were trying to map out all the different stakeholders and they had this really complex diagram and they're trying to explain this to us. Um, and I, I was concerned. There was a point where I was like, it's so complex. Are they gonna do this project justice, right? Are they really gonna take into account the nuances of what this system actually has entailed? Because a lot of times as a designer, you're like, we, that's too much to take on. We should just focus on one area first. They're like, this is all part of a big system. One little fix is not going to change everything. We have to take into account all these different stakeholders. And so I just wanted to applaud you guys on thinking about that complexity, really working with these different stakeholders. And I think it really showed in the final presentation, your kind of knowledge. Like, even though there's definitely experts that are here that are helping guide you, that how much that you learned in this kind of uh, in this environment. And I think there were times when Axel would always say, it's like, we're not really the experts anymore. Like you guys know so much more about this than we do. And, uh, and so I just want to commend you on that. And I think one thing I want to kind of point out is there's, when you take on a complex project like this, one of the hardest things to do is how do you make it something that other people can really understand? People that aren't those people that are in the system. How can they understand the different roles, the reasons why this is important? Um, especially for me, like I don't know anything about this before this project. And then how can you display and tell that story in a way that somebody like me can really understand? And so I think you guys did such a great job of like blending the line of showing the detail and the thought, plus make it approachable for other people that are outside of it. So I just wanted to give you guys props on that while I still had a little bit of time and just to acknowledge that as a team, what you guys have accomplished. So great work and congratulations. Thank you so much. And I, I also want to, to very much thank again, the Northwest incident, Northwest 12 incident management team for giving us that firsthand experience uh, with the two fires and just really letting us feel part of the team. And um, Richie Harrod for introducing us to them and Dee Townsend for introducing us to Richie and Roz for introducing us to Dee. So it really has been a huge process of like making these connections and having these relationships. And also thanks so much to Dave and Alan. And Alan is here today. Thank you for working with us since the spring quarter and all of our other interviewees, industry friends and alumni for, for all the great advice in our cohort for being so supportive. Uh, really appreciate everything. And our faculty and advisors for all your support too. Uh, we really, this project could not have been done without all of these people that have been supporting us and helping us all the way. I really want to acknowledge that and everyone's willingness to help is what made this project great. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Okay, does that mean this is it? We're wrapping up? We can uh, say I, I, can, I can put a wrap up first <laughs> okay. a little bit. So Thanks, I Kat. think just thank you everybody for attending and really supporting both this team, but also this program. And I think it means a lot to us that you guys are willing to commit your time to supporting these students. And we do not take that for granted and definitely would hopefully keep some of this relationship going if you guys are interested as well. Um, and I just wanna say, uh, just because this is over doesn't mean you guys have to just close the meeting. So if you guys wanna keep talking, um, you guys are free to do that as well. 
Um, if anybody is interested as well, uh, these students, um, the whole cohort has an event later this afternoon at three o'clock. Um, it's kind of the open night where all the teams do quick presentations so you can see what some of the other projects 